This presentation is about technology of cheese manufacture part 3 which involves cheese ripening including accelerated ripening. Now as we all know that the green cheese that is cheese prepared after pressing on the same day the cheese has been made has no commercial value. However, there are several cheese varieties which needs to be ripened in order to develop the desired flavor, body and texture so as to have the commercial value after which it is put into the market for sale. However, cheese ripening which may involve even ripening of 2 months to even 12 or more months is again a very costly process and hence scientists all over the world have tried their best to accelerate the process of ripening so that the cost involved in ripening of the cheese can be curbed. Now let us see why there is a need for ripening the cheese. Any unripe cheese does not possess the requisite flavor and body texture. In order to develop these attributes such as flavor as well as body and texture, the cheese needs to be kept under a fixed conditions of environment such as temperature, relative humidity and period in order for the cheese to be cured. Manufacture of processed cheese because in India majority of the cheeses for example the basic raw material is cheddar cheese which after ripening is processed in the form of a processed cheese which has got a commercial value when it is sold as processed cheese in the market. Preparation of this processed cheese needs blending of the same cheddar cheese but of different varied ripening ages. For example, we have to combine uh, cheddar cheese that is ripened for one to one and a half months, another one which is medium ripe say about three and a half to four months and a fully ripe cheese which may be ripened to a degree of five to seven months. All of these three together are blended and then processed in order to have a shelf life from the very that day on which the processed cheese is prepared. For these we need to ripen the cheese. This slide shows the ripening conditions that is apt for a specific variety of cheese. In this slide we have shown four different cheeses, cheddar, Swiss, blue and grana padano cheese. To give the characteristics of some cheese, Swiss cheese is a cheese having eyes. That is the development of the holes in the body of the cheese can be made possible only through use of a specific starter culture such as Propioni bacterium shermani in case of Swiss cheese. In case of blue cheese, mold is deliberately added as a starter culture which gives the blue coloration and the, as the name says the blue cheese. So specific cheese needs to be ripened under a specific condition. In case of cheddar, the ripening conditions required is 10 to 12 degrees centigrade and an relative humidity of 85 percent and the period of ripening may range from 6 to 12 months depending on the type of starter culture used and the rennet involved. Generally use of the rennet substitutes such as the fungal rennets requires less amount of aging whereas calf rennet which is prevalent in other countries will lead to ripening for a greater period up to even one year. Swiss cheese needs to be ripened at 10 to 15 degrees centigrade but later on after several one month or so it needs to be ripened at a higher temperature of 20 to 24 degrees centigrade. The total ripening period for Swiss cheese is minimum two months which it may extend up to two and a half months. For blue cheese initially warm curing at about 17 to 18 degrees centigrade followed by 
low temperature curing at 10 degrees centigrade is advocated. The minimum conditions for period is 2 months, whereas sometimes it may range up to 3 to 4 months for proper development of the flavor and body texture. In case of Grana Padano cheese, the ripening period may range from 16 to as high as 20 months. The cheese ripening involves lot of biochemical changes that occurs during the entire period of ripening. In this slide, we will be seeing the biochemical changes that take place during cheese ripening. The major reactions which are involved in cheese ripening are mainly four. Number one, bring proteolysis. This has got a lot of bearing on the body and texture of cheese. We all know that the cheese during its period of ripening involves some mellowing of the texture. It becomes little softer, more cohesive and elastic. That is as a result of the proteolytic changes that take place during cheese ripening. The second biochemical change involving is lipolysis. This is of very high significance for cheese which requires the free fatty acids for its flavor development. So that means for any mold ripened cheeses where free fatty acid is of prime importance, lipolysis has a major role to play. Whereas in case of cheddar, which is a very hard category of cheese, there the contribution of lipolysis is of less importance compared to those for the mold ripened cheeses. The third biochemical change which we will be seeing is glycolysis, which is breakdown of the carbohydrate that is lactose present in milk or cheese, which has got a bearing on the conversion of this lactose into acetates and carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is one of the necessary end product which dictates the eye formation in Swiss cheese which comes only as a result of ripening. The fourth biochemical changes that involves in cheese ripening is citrate metabolism. This is of significance for flavor development in cheese especially when we are using some starter cultures like Leuconostroc citroverum, which can also be utilized in cheddar cheese making. Even though these are secondary starter cultures over and above the main primary lactic acid bacteria, they have a profound influence on the resultant flavor of the cheese upon cheese ripening. This slide discusses the factors that influences the cheese ripening. There are several factors which influences cheese ripening. Among that, the prime importance is the storage temperature, especially the ripening temperature and the relative humidity that is kept. However, with the use of the cryovac packs, wherein we are covering the entire cheddar cheese block, there the role played by relative humidity is of less importance compared to what was being traditionally done when cryovac was not used, rather the cheese block was waxed and it was kept for about a year for cheese ripening. Storage temperature other than the accelerated ripening should be maintained as we already saw in the previous slide, a specific condition required for a specific cheese ripening. The second factor involves the chemical composition of the curd especially the fat content and the level of amino acids and fatty acids as well as the products of enzymatic action. We all know that the free fatty acids upon lipolysis can be produced only if we use a cheese having desired fat or the fat on dry matter content. Likewise, the protein content in the cheese curd will dictate the amount of amino acids that can be produced upon proteolysis. And hence, such chemical composition of the curd has got a bearing on 
the cheese ripening and the flavor and the texture that is produced. Finally, the residual microflora of the curd, primarily those used as a starter culture, has got a bearing on the cheese ripening. We all know that in cheese making, one of the processing factors includes the cooking temperature. Higher cooking temperature can have a little negative influence on the growth of the microflora, reducing their numbers. Whereas, if the such type of starter cultures are used and moderate cooking temperatures are used, rather their numbers will be thriving of the starter cultures and upon liberation of their enzymes such as the lipases and the proteases, the cheese ripening can definitely be affected positively. With regard to the proteolysis of cheese ripening, three major components are very much involved. The first being the rennet enzyme that is used to coagulate the milk into a rennet curd. Some of the rennet continues its activity even during the ripening of the cheese, specifically the hard varieties. The other factors involved in ripening include the starter proteinases and the peptidases. The initial hydrolysis of the casein, which is the major milk protein in the cheese curd, is does take place by the residual coagulant, that is the rennet, and the inherent plasmin, that is the proteolytic enzyme that is present in the inherently in milk. The breakdown of the large peptides by the starter proteinases and peptidases into medium and small peptides also carries forward during the further ripening, which further hydrolyzes into smaller peptides and the resultant free amino acids, which is carried out by the starter peptidases and the dipeptides. For this, we need to keep the cheese under a specific ripening conditions to occur during its ripening. Let us discuss the lipolytic changes that takes place during cheese ripening. We all know that certain free fatty acids are very important, responsible for the flavor of the resultant cheese after ripening. Some free fatty acids are precursors for several volatile compounds, which are formed as a result of lipolysis that have a contribution to the flavor of the resultant cheese. Certain free fatty acids having short chain length such as a carbon number C4 to C10 have been implicated with a strong flavor of the resultant cheese. These lipases can originate from several sources, one being the inherent milk lipase. Some can come from the rennet paste that is used for coagulating the milk. Some starter bacteria can also produce the lipolytic enzymes. Secondary starter microorganisms, non-starter lactic acid bacteria and even exogenous lipase preparations have been used for cheese ripening in certain varieties of cheese. Continuing with the lipolytic changes that takes place during cheese ripening, the free fatty acids, they are precursors of the flavor and aroma compounds, namely the methyl ketones, lactones, esters, alkanes and the secondary alcohols. All these together decide the background flavor of the cheese, particularly those relying on such flavor precursor compounds. In case of Swiss cheese, where we try to use the propionic acid bacteria such as Propionibacterium shermani, they are highly proteolytic compared to the lactic acid bacteria and they hydrolyze the triglycerides at a maximum rate to products such as tripropionine, tributrine, tricaproin and finally the caprolin. 
these are the compounds which are responsible for the peculiar and the inherent flavor of swiss cheese looking into the mold ripened cheeses where they use penicillium roqueworthy as one of the mold it produces potent extracellular lipases which are responsible for extensive lipolysis that is observed in a blue cheese and this is what is responsible for the flavor of such cheese such as blue the third important biochemical change that occurs during cheese ripening is glycolysis we all know that the lactose present in the cheese milk has already undergone fermentation by the starter culture during cheese making to lactic acid however further changes in the carbohydrate continues during cheese ripening resulting in flavor development and sometimes even in eye development as the case with swiss cheese in glycolysis lactose is converted to pyruvate which subsequently is converted into lactate such lactate is the substrate for a range of reactions that contributes to cheese ripening by metabolism to namely acetic acid that is acetate and carbon dioxide by diverse microflora through the oxidative pathway eye development in swiss cheese is due to production of carbon dioxide and water by propionibacterium frudenreichi subspecies shermani by metabolizing the lactate in the cheese curd and we know that only during ripening there is development of the eyes in swiss cheese which is characteristics of such cheese such is the importance of glycolysis in cheese ripening the current slide shows the free fatty acid levels present in a given cheese variety as we have seen earlier even though the free fatty acid are important for the flavor and to some extent to the body and texture the extent of free fatty acid development is minimal in majority of the hard varieties whereas for mold ripened cheese varieties flavor development through lipolysis is the only answer for such cheese varieties in this table if you look at the mold ripened varieties such as blue mold and the roquefort varieties you will see that the free fatty acid content as milligram per kg of the cheese is to the tune of more than 32000 per kg of the cheese whereas where we don't require greater amount of the free fatty acid development and where we don't have the contribution of the molds in such cheese ripening such as edam mozzarella you will see that the free fatty acid is to the tune of 350 to 360 mg per kg only the romano which is an italian cheese variety has again a intermediate free fatty acid content to the tune of 6700 mg per kg this shows that the level of free fatty acid produced in a given cheese variety will dictate its final resultant cheese quality as a result of cheese ripening we have just discussed about the cheese ripening and how it is important for a given cheese variety especially the ripened one however the cost of this cheese ripening is enormous looking at the refrigeration cost that is involved in keeping such cheese under refrigerated conditions for 2 months to say more than a year hence researchers all around the world have tried to accelerate the cheese ripening to reduce the period during which such development of the flavor and body and texture can take place in this slide let us see some of the methods that have been used to accelerate cheese ripening one of the very simpler methods is using the elevated ripening temperature that is utilizing temperatures which are little greater than what is was conventionally used for cheese ripening 
say for example for hard varieties like cheddar generally we use 11 or 10 degree centigrade for cheddar if we increase by say 2 to 3 degree centigrade such as 13 degree centigrade you will find that instead of ripening for 6 to 8 months we can get it at a lesser ripening period of within 24 weeks however a caution has to be exercised that the later part of the ripening has to be carried out under a colder conditions otherwise the accelerated biochemical activities may lead to spoilage of the cheese within a shorter period. The second method is by utilizing increasing number of the viable cells with desired attributes. We know that whenever the cell numbers are increased, their chances of liberating the extracellular enzymes are higher. This greater number of extracellular enzymes can help during the cheese ripening, increasing the proteolytic and sometimes even the lipolytic changes. Third method that can be used is use of crude cell-free extracts or partially purified extracts to the cheese milk or the curd. We know that some of these enzymes, may, namely the proteolytic or the lipolytic enzymes, they need to be extracted from the body of the starter cultures. Utilizing some modification techniques, we can remove these enzymes from the cells by lysis and which is known as the crude cell-free extracts and these enzymes can have a greater impact once we are adding it either into the cheese milk or even at the juncture of obtaining the cheese curd. Another method includes use of exogenous and entrapped enzymes. The meaning of entrapped enzyme is using the micro encapsulated enzymes because we can monitor the release of these enzymes at a specific stage. For instance, after cooking or when the curd is going to be pressed. So, under a given condition, we can use such entrapment techniques during which such enzymes can be liberated and they will have their action only during such phases. Finally, in this slide, you can see we can also use cheese slurry system wherein a higher temperature is used, greater moisture content in the cheese is deliberately used to obtain a cheese slurry such as a paste which when kept at a little greater ripening conditions can have this greater biochemical changes which will lead to faster flavor development which can be incorporated into the cheese making at the curd to obtain the desired accelerated cheese ripening. Continuing with the methods that have been adopted to accelerate the cheese ripening, other methods include use of attenuated bacterial cultures. We know that any type of bacteria through any modification, if they can enhance their secretion of the proteolytic or lipolytic enzymes can have a in positive impact in accelerating the cheese ripening. Likewise, use of culture adjunct, that is in addition to the conventional cultures, if we can utilize some other adjunct cultures which can help in liberating the exogenous enzymes, can help a long way in accelerating the cheese ripening. Likewise, tailor made lactic acid bacteria with desired enzyme attributes can also be taken help of in accelerating the cheese ripening. Some of the latest technology such as high pressure processing, once we adopt this in cheese milk, in manufacture of cheese, has been shown to accelerate the cheese ripening to some extent and hence use of such new technology can also be utilized in accelerating the cheese ripening. In this slide, 
let us see the merits and demerits of utilizing accelerated ripening for the manufacture of cheese and cheese products. It is very well known that the merit is especially by reducing the storage period, especially the ripening, if we can decrease the period from one year to six to seven months, there will be reduction in the ripening for say three to four months. This can give a tremendous saving in terms of even the refrigeration cost that is involved while allowing the cheese blocks to be remaining in the cheese cold store for aging or ripening. And hence, we get lot of economy since the time required for maturation is decreased as well as the storage space required can be reduced since we are able to remove the cheese blocks which are already ripened under acceleration. Now looking into the demerits or disadvantages of cheese ripening, use of starter adjunct or exogenous enzymes may sometimes lead to over acidification or even alteration in the cheese texture. Hence, we have to be very cautious in using the starter adjunct only after looking to its properties. Bitterness in cheese, especially the cheddar or the hard varieties, can be again a possible defect. However, with continued maturation further, it may happen that the bitter peptides may be further broken down into the non-bitter peptides, reducing the bitterness altogether. So, we have to again monitor the changes in terms of the sensory quality even during ripening of such cheeses involving the accelerated cheese ripening. Lastly, some cost may be additionally involved in utilizing some requisites required for accelerated cheese ripening. For instance, if we use the latest technique like high pressure processing, the cost of capital cost of such equipment is quite high and the total cost of cheese may be increased by utilizing such latest technologies. Similarly, micro encapsulation of the starters or their enzymes in cheese making may involve some little more additional cost. These are again some of the demerits associated with cheese ripening. In the current presentation, we have seen what is cheese ripening, how it is important for a given variety of cheese and what are the means available for accelerating the cheese ripening, especially for economy. Whenever cheese is ripened, we need to know up to what extent it has been ripened so that we know now this is the stage at which we can allow the cheese to go into the market maybe for preparation of even the processed cheese as one of the blend in the processed cheese portions. So in order to evaluate the cheese ripening, there are some indices. Some of these biochemical indices include number one, monitoring the proteolysis. This can very well be done by analyzing in a quality assurance lab for soluble nitrogen, liberated amino acids such as L-glutamic acid, the tyrosine. Since we know that as a result of proteolysis, more and more nitrogenous substances is going to be getting solubilized, which gives an indice whether more proteolysis has taken place or otherwise. The electrophoretic pattern of ripened cheese can also give an insight into the proteolysis that takes place in the cheese. If you have got a marker protein which shows the intact protein and in case of a cheese one which is already undergoing ripening, you will see that some of the casein fraction such as the alpha S, beta or the kappa casein is undergoing fragmentation which will be showing a different electrophoretic pattern indicating that a ripening change has occurred. 
Second method of biochemical change that can be mo monitored is lipolysis. For this, we can involve estimation of acid degree value, thiobarbituric acid value, and even the total volatile fatty acids. All of these are as a result of the changes of lipase acting on the lipids present in a cheese, giving even rise to the free fatty acid development. Finally, physical indice has also been utilized in monitoring the extent of cheese ripening. The rheology of the cheese, for instance, the hardness, the springiness or elasticity, the cohesiveness of the cheese, many of these attributes will show a dramatic change when a given cheese, maybe a soft or a hard variety of cheese, is undergoing the cheese ripening. Looking to these changes, maybe softening of the cheese or increasing the cohesiveness of the cheese, we can come to know whether the cheese has been ripened to the desired extent or otherwise. With this, we come to an end to the monitoring of the cheese ripening which you can carry out in a quality assurance lab which is of very importance since we wish to know to what extent the cheese is ripened before we send it to the market for marketing.